It's so wonderful in this crazy and chaotic world that we have such a good shepherd. The chief shepherd, the great shepherd of the flock, and we are his flock. We're in John chapter 10, and that's what, exactly what John is describing for us, the words of Jesus, and he uses this metaphor, this motif of the shepherd and his sheep, and that's a common motif throughout the scriptures, particularly in the Old Testament, right, who is referred to over and over and over again as the shepherd of the flock, God himself. There are three psalms in particular that I think about whenever I think of the shepherd in the Old Testament. The, the shepherd psalms, do you know which ones those are? That's it. Very good. Yeah. 22, 23, and 24. And, and if you really took a look at those, in light of these three parables that we're learning, we learned the first parable last week. The first parable, Jesus represented himself as the shepherd who calls his sheep by name. Remember? There was that public sheepfold, that walled enclosure, that all of the shepherds, when they came into the city, would bring all of the flocks into that one enclosure, a multitude of flocks. But then in the morning, the morning call would come out where the shepherd would come out and call his own. And he would call each by name. And what was described for us was that each of the sheep know their shepherd's voice. Now, you know the voice of the shepherd, don't you? Yeah. They would not follow someone who is not their shepherd because they do not know that shepherd's voice, do they? You ever been anywhere where suddenly you heard something said that was supposedly about God or representing God or about God's word? And you, Wait a minute. That's not my shepherd. That doesn't line up with what I know, my Jesus. No, 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 no. And so he would call each out by name. And then he would say, come, follow me, my little lambs, right? Each of the disciples that Jesus called, he called each of them specifically, singularly, individually, by name. And I asked the question last week, do you know, do you know that you know that you know in your heart of hearts that Jesus has specifically, individually called you by name? And has a calling upon your life. And to come and follow him. And we made the distinction last week that you're not to live your own life. That's not what Jesus asked you to do. Oh, just appreciate me, be a fan of me, applaud me, but then go ahead and live your own life. No, no, no. What does he say? Lay down your life for my sake and you'll find it. Come and follow me. Live the life that I have prepared for you. And you'll find joy. You'll find the abundant life. Oh, we'll talk about that in a moment. That was your assignment last week, wasn't it? Some of you might remember. But in John chapter 10, there's two more parables that Jesus taught with regard to this motif of the shepherd and the sheep. The first one was he is the shepherd who calls out his sheep by name. The second one that we're going to look at this morning is that he is the door. This will be the third time he refers to himself as the I am. The I am was the tetragrammaton, the four-letter word for God. In the Hebrew, I am, I am the eternal one. I am whatever you need me to be. So in this second parable, the second motif, he says, I am the door. When we get into the third parable this morning, and I do hope to get there, he is the good shepherd who does what? Lays down his life for the sheep. The shepherd who calls his sheep by name. And they follow him and it gives them meaning and purpose. The good shepherd who protects his sheep, provides for his sheep, guides his sheep. The great shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And each one of those parables will line up with each one of those psalms. The shepherd psalms, 22, 23, and 24. It's just in reverse order. The first parable would line up with Psalm 24, the second parable will line up with Psalm 23. You all know Psalm 23, don't you? The Lord is, I shall not. Yeah, he's your ever becoming one. And then the last parable, the one who would lay down his life for the sheep, that lines up with Psalm 22, the shepherd and his cross. So in those three Psalms, and maybe, maybe next week, maybe, would you like me to go through those with you? Would you? Those are great Psalms. So I'll plan to do that as well as we're going through this section of John chapter 10. We'll take a diversion and go through the, the Psalms of the shepherd. Shepherd and his cross, the shepherd and his crook, the shepherd and his crown. He's the one who calls you by name and says, come follow me. Why? Because I'm the leader and you follow the leader, right? <laughs> All right. So that's where we left off last week. And verse 6 of chapter 10, boy, we made a lot of progress, didn't we? 
Yeah. Verse 6, after Jesus gave this parable with regard to him being the, the good shepherd who calls his sheep by name, Jesus used this illustration, verse 6, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Anybody have another translation on verse 6 other than you, Jesus used this illustration? Parable. That's exactly what it should be. Yep. Parable. That's why I say these are three parables. These three illustrations or motifs of the shepherd and the sheep. These are parables. What is a parable? An earthly story with a spiritual heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Right? Physical, worldly story with a spiritual application or meaning. That's what a parable is. And that's what these are. So Jesus begins to say in verse 7, truly, Truly, is what he's going to say here. He said the same thing in the first verse of chapter 10 when he said, most assuredly, it could, that's with translating the verily, verily, or truly, truly. They didn't understand everything that Jesus said is in fact true. Is that not true? Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe all the Bible? Is it true because it's in the Bible? No. What? It's in the Bible because it's true, okay? And you can, you can validate that. You can prove that. You can go ahead and do an apologetic on all that Jesus says with regard to uh, precept, what he teaches. It's all true. It's true, and that's why it's in the Bible. But it's not in the Bible because it's true. So we don't follow this blindly. You understand the difference? Hmm. And so Jesus is trying to emphasize the point to these false shepherds. And there were many false shepherds. He warns of these false shepherds, these selfish kings, these corrupt imposters who claim to be the Messiah. And all they came to do was to steal, to consume, to destroy. Hmm? He goes on to say, most assuredly, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, in the first parable, that motif, the, the sheepfold was that public enclosure, remember? It would be in the city, and it would be a large walled enclosure, one way in, one way out, and there would be a doorkeeper, the gatekeeper. Who was the gatekeeper spiritually? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the gatekeeper, right? And, and the gatekeeper opens the door. Hmm? Who opened the door of your heart to receive Jesus? Who opened the door? Who gave you a listening ear and seeing eyes to know when you're Shepherd was calling. It was the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit's God, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Hmm? But in this motif, it's a little different. It's when the shepherd takes his sheep out. He calls them by name, and they come out of that public sheepfold, and the way they go out into the countryside to bring them into the area where they would graze, to bring them to the place where the still water would be, where he would care and guide for his sheep. And he might be out there for weeks at a time. Out in the wilderness. Now, the first thing he would do, in that, and he'd get, pick an area that he was going to allow his sheep to graze for some period of time. And as he got there, the first thing he would do, he would build a wilderness enclosure. And he'd use thickets and briars, and he'd use stones. But, but he'd make sure he built an enclosure large enough for his flock, specifically. And there would only be one way into that enclosure and one way out. And that's what he's talking about now. And as he went out in there, then the shepherd, as the sheep were grazing, he'd be watching from that enclosure, from that place of safety, of security, of shelter. And any of the sheep that came, they could enter in there whenever they were afraid or scared. Hmm. I, I think of Snickers. We have a uh, kennel for Snickers, and if you ever trained a dog, you want to train a dog using a, a kennel, their enclosure. But their enclosure is their safe space. Their enclosure is the place they go when, when they feel insecure, or they just want to be left alone, and they don't want to be bothered, you know, and they'll go right into there, and they'll stay there. And then they're telling you, don't bother me, you know, this man cave. <laughs> Well, essentially, that's what would happen. The sheep would be out there grazing, and then when they wanted to lie down safely and secure and trusting, they would go into that enclosure, but they would go into that enclosure, and they would have to bypass the shepherd. He's the door. The sheep could never, no, no other sheep could get in there except his own sheep into that enclosure, through that door, through that gate, through that portal, and there they would find security. There they would find safety, 
peace, rest. They could rest from uh, free of all fear and anxiety. Do you feel that way when you walk in a church? I feel that way in two places in particular. Home and church. You know, it's, it's getting crazier and crazier out there, isn't it? But, but when, you, when you walk through the threshold of your home, ah, oh, home. And, and it should be. It should be a place free from conflict and hostility. It should be a place of love and joy and peace. I'm Italian. And once in a while, when I want to talk to something, some sub- subject to Miss Gale that I'm excited about, I raise my voice. Now, Snickers doesn't understand English or Italian. But the inflection of my voice, he gets concerned, thinking, well, I think, I think, I think the shepherd, I think, I'm not a shepherd, I'm a sheepdog. I, I think he's upset. And you know where he goes? Into the kennel. When he stops speaking so loudly, I'll come out, but I think something's wrong here. <laughs> There's a lot of noise going on out there, isn't there? And sometimes we get frightened by all that noise we're hearing. Don't be afraid. Perfect love Cast out all fear. Now, it's not, it's, listen, this is not the threshold of your home or the, even the threshold of the church, although I love coming to this place. I always feel so safe, secure. I, all of the worries of the world, all the cares of the world just kind of disappear when I come in here. I don't know how it is for you. But most importantly, the only reason for that is because Jesus is in our homes. Jesus is here in our church. Jesus is in your heart and in your life. And all you have to do, if you want that place of peace, of safety, of security, of assurance, is put your focus on him. Enter through the door, the portal, the gate. That's what Jesus is referring to here. Yeah. And so this is what we're talking about now. This is the... Shepherd who lies at the door guarding his sheep. No one gets in that doesn't belong in there. And if there's any danger, they don't get out either. I have said to you on numerous occasions, I am so appreciative and grateful for God's saving grace, aren't you? Yeah. Justification. I am equally, maybe more so, thankful for his keeping grace. His sanctification. Do you sanctify yourself? Of course you don't. No, you have no power to cleanse yourself. You have no power to keep yourself on on that right path. It's when we pray to Jesus and ask Jesus, Lord, Lord, keep me, Lord. You are my shepherd. I am your sheep. Guide me, protect me, watch over me, and don't ever let me walk astray, Lord. Don't let me walk to the left or to the right, but let me follow you straight ahead, Lord. That's his keeping grace. And when you know you're experiencing his keeping grace through sanctification, you have absolute assurance of what? His ultimate glorifying grace. He's going to take you home. He's the shepherd. We talked about it last week. He's the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd who leaves the 90 and 9 and what? Goes after the one. When you start going astray, how many times have you started going astray and the shepherd came got you? Began to knock on the door of your heart once again say, hey, 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 come on. It's not, it's not who we are now. Come. True? Yes. Give testimony? Amen. I'm the only one? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're looking at here. The shepherd who calls them by name, and now they follow him and lead him out. And we are in this world, but we're not of this world, are we? He said, in this world you will have... You'll have tribulations, you'll have troubles, you'll have testings, but be a good cheer, I have. And when you experience those testings, those trials, those temptations, where should you run? To the gate, to the door, to the sheepfold, to the portal, to the Lord. Don't succumb to the temptations. Don't, listen, don't be discouraged. There's a lot that's going to take place in the near future that may discourage you terribly if you're looking at the world. And what is taking place out there? Look to Jesus, and it'll be so clear for you what is exactly happening. We we can give commentary on what is happening in our world today, not by looking out at the world, but by looking at the Word. And the Word describes for me exactly what is taking place in the world. 
Corey Ten Boom, you know, everybody knows who Corey Ten Boom is, right? Wonderful Christian there who was rescuing her family, she and her family rescuing Jews from the Holocaust. And when she got captured and was put in the concentration camp, she would repeat over and over again, look without and become distressed. If you look out at the world situation, there's a lot to be distressed about, isn't there? How, how about 20 years of a war in Afghanistan? How about $2 trillion spent? You and I don't have an idea what trillion is. $2 trillion what that would buy. How about almost 3,000 American lives? Countless American servicemen and women who've been wounded, lost their limbs, their eyesight. How about those who are suffering from the mental anxiety and distress? And for what reason? Listen to me. for fear of becoming political, I'm not afraid to be political, (laughs) the military-industrial complex that's been around since shortly after World War II, where just a handful of people become richer and richer and richer and more and more powerful. That's what that was about over there. You think we couldn't win a war after 20 years and $2 trillion? We don't want to stop firing guns. We don't want to stop supplying equipment. We don't want to stop dropping bombs. They get very, very rich. The Cheneys, the Bushes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I wasn't a saved man, it would be very distressing. Oh, the other side does it with their green emphasis, right? <laughs> like they, God bless you, my dear. Like they really care about the environment. Really? No. Their motivation is the same as those who support the military industrial complex. They become filthy, and it is filthy rich. Look without, become distressed. Now, what can you do about that? What can you do about the problems we have right now? What man can solve the problems that we have right now around? No one, no one. So you look within and you become depressed. Look without, you become distressed. Look within, look to Jesus. Find your shalom, your rest, your peace. Hey, hey, if you're a believer and the Holy Spirit is in your heart today, it all works out beautifully in the end. (laughs) Isn't that something to celebrate? Thank you, Jesus. Most assuredly, I say to you, I am. This is the third time he uses that I am. First time was I am the bread of life. The second time was I am the light of the world. But now I am the door. John 14, 6. What does it say? No one comes to the Father except by me, through me, in me. Is that true? The exclusivity of Jesus Christ, that he is the door, the portal, the way, no other gate, no other way. Is that true? Look without. 80% of those who claim to be born again say people of other, good, pe- good people of other faiths go to heaven. How can that be? Wait a minute. One door. One portal. One gate. One way. Is that true? Is that true? You, you need, now you need to lovingly proclaim that because there's a lot of people who claim his name who really aren't expressing a saving knowledge of Jesus. There is no other way. One way. One shepherd. One door. Amen? All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he She will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture, find their rest. What's this word saved here? In the Greek text, you know the word? Somebody know the word? Sudzo. Sudzo is the word in the Greek to be saved. Uh, It's it's from the root word, isois, 
Iso is that sound familiar? You know, the submariners, if their submarine goes down, you know, that's what you'll hear. That's an international distress call. Everyone in the world knows what that means. Is O S S O S. I need to be rescued. Help me. Save me. Deliver me. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you enter by the door, by the gate, by the, by the life of Jesus, you will be rescued. You need to be rescued, right? What do I need to be rescued from? Myself. <laughs> yeah, that's secondary. First and foremost, what do you need to be rescued from? The wrath of God. The whole world lies under the wrath of God if they don't come to him on his terms. He's the king. He establishes the terms. And the terms of surrender are his way. And it's a complete and total surrender to him. He gave his life for you. And you, in turn, give your life for him. Exchange life principle. That's what he means. When, when you're re- Soteriology is what we call this in theology. It's the study of salvation. Soteria, sidzo, to be rescued, to be saved. Do you understand? You didn't do Jesus a favor when you came to him, Right? No, he sought you out and he blessed you eternally by saving your soul. We may lose our life. And who knows? I mean, you're afraid of death? No, I'm not afraid to die. I'm just concerned about how it's going to happen. Right? You know? I don't like pain. I go to my dentist. I tap him on the thigh. I say, no, you hurt me, I hurt you. I just want you to know. Okay? It's the way it works here. We're under... You know, I don't, I don't like pain. I'm, I'm not afraid to die, though. I know where I'm going. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I've been rescued. Mm. Yes, whoever came before me, they were thieves, they were robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. And that's the only way you can understand and explain that multitudes of gullible people that are following all these false shepherds today. There are so many false teachers today, totally, totally misrepresenting God and his word. Be careful when you're in one of those gatherings where there's hundreds of people and nobody has a Bible. Listen, I, just, just for the experience... I visited a number of mega churches in my day. And I, I, I remember one time in particular, I was with my, my first wife, Roberta, and this very charismatic pastor, young guy, you know, he's buffed, he had some tags, and he, you know, little, and he was, you know, very cool, man. You know, I mean, that's how they present Christianity, is being cool. So if you're part of their group, then you're cool. You're being a cool Christian. And and nobody had a Bible, and he misquoted the scriptures three times. And everybody's laughing, and the misquotes were very serious alterations of the truth of God's word. And the third time, I finally had to get up and walk out. I couldn't stand it anymore. No one, in, in this crowd of several hundred people, no one recognized that they were in the midst of a wolf who came for one reason, to steal them away from the truth and to devour them. That's what wolves do, don't they? When wolves or robbers, rustlers come in to the sheepfold, what is their purpose? They want to steal away the sheep. And then what do they do to the sheep once they've stolen them away? Devour them. Destroy them. Eat them. And that's, Listen, that's what these people do. And then, they, and then they're destroyed. Then they're shipwrecked. Then they give up on Christianity and Jesus. Tried that. Didn't work. I'm just thinking of some really bad examples where, where, where someone enters into the word of faith craziness. You, you're familiar with that craziness where, where you, listen, you don't ever have to suffer disease. There should be no suffering in your life whatsoever in any way if you have enough faith. And oh, by the way, They teach. Listen, this is what they teach. That if you have enough faith, like Jesus, you give up your ghost when you're ready. You determine the day of your death. 
That's the extreme. Now, now, in those environments, if you become sick, if you become a cancer patient, what's the problem? Your lack of faith. You know, if, if you, listen, if you had enough faith, Jesus would heal you. Oh, the problem isn't Jesus. The problem isn't our doctrine or our understanding. It's your faith. It's your, oh, your little faith, your lack of faith. Hmm. When my, my first wife, the Lord took her through cancer, and I had a couple of people come to me and tell me that. And I said, you're fortunate I'm a saved man or you'd need a, you need a doctor and I would need a lawyer. But that's, and I, and I, I, unfortunately, how many people do you know, how many people do you know that have suffered shipwreck because they believe that and then they became ill or someone they love dearly becomes ill? And then what? If that's a God of love, what? I don't want nothing to do with you. Who needs it? And that's precisely what happened. They come to, to steal, to rob, and to destroy. Thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Oh, but I have come that they may have life. Zoe, life. The experience. Now, not just in the by and by, but now, life. And that they may have it more abundantly. You know, this was your assignment last week. What was your assignment? That's right. Okay, Deborah, go ahead. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can we get a mic? Because we have some people listening online, so John Michael's going to pass the mic around. If you have an answer, Deborah, keep it short. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, go ahead, Deborah. We love you. I didn't say I was going to answer the question. You just asked what the assignment was. Give me your answer. Oh, okay. It begins at salvation. The abundant life begins at salvation. Okay. And it continues, okay, you said according to Scripture, so 324, Romans. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay. All right. So we begin by believing in Christ. Right. All right. Okay. So this, then, is, this is all the way of salvation. I want okay. to know specifically. Okay. I'm yep. getting there. You should answer the question according right. to Scripture. And I said, sure. <laughs> sure. All right. So go to Galatians 2.20. For it is now no longer I who ah. live. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but he who Christ lives, lives me. through me. And the abundant life is he's given me everything that I need for good works to live life according to his will and yeah. purpose. Very good. Very good. Somebody else have an answer for me. The, the question last week that you were to go home with was Jesus tells us that he gives us the abundant life now. Can you identify or can you define that abundant life from the scriptures that he gives us now? Listen, if, if, if being saved and being in Christ doesn't mean a, a marked difference in our life compared to unbelievers, then why would an unbeliever want to accept what you have to say? There has to be something very different about our lives. There has to be a fullness and a joy and a hope, that an assurance that we have of the future and of the now. Colossians, the hope of glory, right? That I can glorify Christ now in my living. I can have the power over sin. I don't have to be subject to any other outside power. Anybody else? You're the only one? Go ahead, Pat. I'm sorry. We'll get right back to you. Pat first and then Mark. Oh. Okay. (laughs) I'm short and long like Deborah. (laughs) Um, Second Thessalonians, it said, because your faith is growing abundantly. And I think when I look around, that makes life so much better. Because you learn more and you get closer to Jesus and you change. And to me, that's the abundant life. It's just everything, your knowledge changes, your focus changes, everything changes and you just grow in faith abundantly. I thought that was okay. a big deal. Good, Good. Yeah. yeah. Mark? Wait, wait for your mic. Wait till you give the mic. I thought it just meant that you... Enjoy the life that he created for you. That when you wake up in the morning, you're just happy. You see the kids in the front row, and they just, you enjoy life. You don't have the regrets. It's true. It's true. Yes. Now, do you have a scripture verse to support that? 
What you're saying? 1010. 1010. That's right, not 1010. Well, yes, it's contained within 1010. I have come to give you life. And life more abundantly. Okay, world. okay, yeah. Anybody else? Jeffrey. To me, the uh, definition of abundance is to want for nothing. So therefore, the 23rd Psalm. Ah, the Lord is my shepherd. shepherd. I, I shall, shall not want. want. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Terry. Uh, John 17, this, uh, verse 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Amen. Amen. Let's string some pearls together. Anybody else? Oh, Carolyn. Carolyn. If you're new to our chapel, we're a family, and this is like a living room discussion. Uh, I'm not a talking head. And so we have a conversation, and our conversation is centered around the Lord and his word so that we can all grow together. Uh, we want to share our knowledge and share our love and share Christ in one another with one another. Carolyn. Um, Isaiah 30, uh, 15. In quietness and rest mm -hmm. shall your strength be. And that verse has always meant so much to me because resting in him, he lives his life through you. Mm. And it's him, not me. Your, your life exemplifies that verse. Quietness and rest. And all the years I've known, 30 years, I think we've known each other now. You know? And you've always been that, that, that sweet, woman of, of assurance and trusting the Lord, of quietness. Of Quiet and a gentle spirit is what? In a woman? Is precious in the sight of the Lord. Yeah. And their husband. Go ahead. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Roger. Yes, you do, because we've got people online. Don't you get rebellious on me now. I, First uh, John 4, 1, it said, Beloved, bleed not every spirit, but try the spirit where they are of God, because many false prophets had mm. gone out into the world. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hearken unto the spirit of God, and you'll experience that abundant life. Anyone else have a comment? Well, let's take a look at uh, 2 Corinthians for a minute. Let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say here on the subject. When you look at the uh, sufferings that Paul had experienced for the cause of Christ, uh, we, we can read what he says in his epistles, but then we know that there are things he doesn't mention in the, his epistles that we can read in the book of Acts. But I don't think there's another man on the face of the earth who has suffered more for the cause of Christ than the Apostle Paul. Just just my opinion, my conjecture. But I don't think there's uh, anyone who's apprehended the understanding of that abundant life more than the Apostle Paul. But look at, look at here in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians. He's talking to the Corinthian church because they're questioning his uh, calling, his apostleship, his authority. He said in verse uh, 4, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God. In, and he's, this is a validation that he's a minister of God. In patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses. In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fasting. By purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. As deceivers, yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying. And behold, we live as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. 
Wow. Now, would you, would you use a list of suffering and trials and temptations like that to validate that you're a Christian? In the West, we don't do that, do we? How, how do most people in the West validate that they're a Christian, that they're under the blessings of God? Business was good. <laughs> right? We prayed the prayer of Jabez. You know what I'm talking about there? That craziness that went around for a while? Hmm, not Paul. Philippians chapter 4, turn there. That we're talking about the abundant, victorious life we're to live. Beginning in uh, the Apostle Paul, I think I want to pick it up in chapter 3 first. Again, the words of the Apostle Paul to the Church of Philippi. Where's Paul at this time? He's in prison in Rome. And where's the church in Philippi? They're free out in the world. They're able to do whatever they want to do. Paul says, verse 7 of chapter 3, but with things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. How much have you suffered for Christ? How much have we, really in the West, how much have we suffered for Christ? Now, now there may be a suffering coming. Watching a, uh, a documentary on a true story uh, in, in Hungary, communist Hungary at the time, and this family that lost everything. They were very wealthy, very successful, very good people. I mean, they were, you know, honest, hardworking. But when communism took over, uh, all of their wealth, their home, everything was confiscated. The husband was murdered, the wife was put in prison, and the children fleed, tried to escape. Finally made it to America. We'd be amazed, wouldn't we, if suddenly this socialist turn we have taken decides to take everything from those who have and give it to those who want it. Not to those who need it, not to those who have not, but to those in power. You know what they're trying to do, right? They, they want to create a society and a world in which you own, and you're happy about it. <laughs> that, that's what the communists did, didn't they? When they took over Europe, and they took over Hungary. They took everything from the people, left them with nothing, and said the state was going to take care of them. What do you do when that happens? What do you do when everything you worked so hard for for so long is taken from you so unjustly by some authoritarian ruler, some despot? You can still have the abundant life, can't you? you? You can still experience the joy of the Lord, the joy of his salvation in your life. And, and many, well, a remnant did in fact do that. Satan can take everything you have in this world. The one thing he can never take from you is your relationship with the Lord and the joy that he affords us. Do you understand that? Now, now if, if some of these crazies have their way, maybe, I don't know, 10 years down the road, that's where we're going to end up with over here. They continue to falsify the elections and continue to maintain their power, we're going to end up owning. And we're going to be happy about it. You know why? Because we're not of this world. We're not taking it with you. brought nothing into this world, and it's certain you're bringing, except those that you love, that you really shared the Lord and the gospel with. That's who you're taking with you. Paul says, I've suffered the loss of everything, all things. But I count it loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of, in verse 8 of chapter 3, 
for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. You know, everybody, how many of you want the power of the resurrection? How does it come? Through suffering. If you want to be an empowered Christian, a dangerous Christian, <laughs> empowered with Christ, it only happens through suffering. As you Listen, we all experience suffering in this life. If you're going to be here any length of time at all, you're going to experience suffering. Now, it's what you do with that suffering. It's how you handle that. It's, it's such a shame when all of that suffering might be for naught and you haven't learned anything. But when you learn to suffer for Christ's sakes, through Christ, oh, what a difference it makes. Yes, that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection, that due to his power, the newness of life, the, the abundant life, and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now look at chapter 4 of Philippians. What did the Philippian church do for Paul that he was so grateful for? They supported his ministry. They took up a collection for him. And they did it, you know, voluntarily, willingly. Here's where I get to talk about money. And giving. <laughs> I never get a chance to do that. <laughs> Paul was so grateful for the Philippians' contribution to his ministry, which could keep him sharing the gospel. If our little chapel depended upon 80% of you to exist, we wouldn't exist. Let that sink in for a minute. If our chapel here depended upon 80% of you to exist, to function, we wouldn't function. I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to condemn you. I don't even know who you are. Let me tell you why I'm saying this. We have an administrator who handles every, all the finances of the church, et cetera, et cetera. Every year, at the end of every year, she gives me a list of the number of giving units or families. You know, Nathan, you're one unit. Okay? But she doesn't give me a name. She just gives me the list. Boom. Unit one, two, three, blah, blah, blah. However. And then she puts down a dollar amount. And then I can calculate what percentage of the church is really supporting the church. 20% of this church supports over 80% of its budget. So what does that mean? That means God wants to get a hold of your heart, whoever you are. I don't know who you are. I just know the numbers. I know there's an unhealthy percentage that is zero. I don't know what that says about your relationship with the Lord. <laughs> I just know that when he got my heart, he got everything, you know? Now, our, the statistic here is not uncommon. That is, that is a common understanding throughout all of Christian dumb. So they're putting more of an emphasis upon what, what they have, right? I'm gonna, I, it's, it's mine and I'm going to keep it. No, you're not. You're going to lose it anyway, right? For certain you brought nothing into this world, for certain not, you're not, nothing's going with you, right? Hmm. Paul was so grateful for this church that, that risked their own safety taking up a collection to give to the apostle Paul so he could survive. And he could go on with his ministry. That's what he's talking about here. We're talking about living the abundant life, the victorious abundant life. He says in verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. He, he, he said, look, you, you, you so bless me. You bless me with your prayers. You bless me with your encouragement. And you bless me with this offering that you've given me. He said, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have... What did he do? Now, you can only, you know, 
he didn't learn this in the schoolroom, did he? He learned from what he, we just talked about previously, all of those sufferings, those trials, those temptations that he went through. He learned through experience. He learned what? To be happy. I was in India for three weeks teaching the country of India. You know, he said, Indians teach Indians, right? Do cowboys teach cowboys? Oh, no, not that kind of Indians. No, India Indians, right? All right, I made it funny. You're the only one I got. All right. I was in India for three weeks, and, and, and I'm speaking to these fellows who are being trained Indians, being trained to be pastors, to minister into their own people. And, and I said, do you, do you want to know what every American desires, every American dreams of? Yes, they are. Yeah, they just don't know it. But not as rich as you are, right? Isn't that, isn't that terrible? We're so discontented, so dissatisfied in this culture. In which we, now, that's, that's purpose. They, they feed that monster. You can't be happy unless you have whatever it is they're selling, you know? Uh, you know, and unless you get the iPhone 27, you know, you, I mean, <laughs> right? But Paul, Paul said, no, 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 I have learned, learned through experience. I've learned that I can be content. I can purpose not to look without and become distressed, not to look within and become distressed, but to look to Jesus and find my shalom, my peace, my rest. Hey, have you learned that yet? Well, you're in the school of contentment. Jesus is allowing these things to come into your life so that you can learn that he's the fullness of all things. To learn that contentment. Paul goes on to say, now that I speak in, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to abase and how to abound everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through who strengtheneth me. Mm. Yes. And Paul would say to his protege, young Timothy, in chapter uh, 5, verse 6, I think it is, of 1 Timothy, that godliness with contentment is... There you go. You got to learn to be content. You got got to learn, you know, to be satisfied. I remember uh, my friend Chico Lopez back there was working on a house up in uh, Tuscany, you know, the big... uh, Development up there, up in the mountain, by Paris Mountain. He said, Pastor Red, you want to believe it. This woman, one woman, one older woman, 10,000 square feet all by herself. One woman. That's nothing. How many of you have been to the Biltmore? You ever been to the Biltmore? Largest single family dwelling in the country. When was it built? The turn of the century, when everybody was horse and buggy? Can you imagine what it would have been like going down that path, that road, and then suddenly coming and saying, this is one person's house? What a gross misuse of the blessing God had given. No wonder. What do they have in the basement? A Halloween room. A Halloween room. Yeah, not a Christmas room. Not a resurrection room, a Halloween room. Hmm. 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 So Paul is telling us that, listen, listen, you want to live the abundant, victorious life that God has for you. Then, then be content with such things as you have. That's what the scripture tells us, right? Be content. No, I'm not saying you shouldn't work hard. I'm not sh- saying you shouldn't have anything. But don't put your heart on possessions. Don't put your heart on pleasures. Don't put your heart on pride and position. Put your heart where it belongs, rightfully, on Jesus. Then godliness with contentment becomes your abundant life. Living, God, living godly is such a joy, isn't it? Now, you, you know what you're like when you sin, you know, probably 10 years ago. Remember 10 years ago when you really willfully did? 
What, what happens when you willfully cross that line? You know, sins, you miss the mark. Okay, I understand that. But transgressions, transgressions are when you willfully cross the line, right? God says, don't do this, and you say, hmm, I'm doing it. And you know, in the Old Testament, what sacrifice would you offer for willful sin? There wasn't one. You were damned. When you entered into willful sin, willful disobedience against the word of God, it was, it was over. Anathema. How many here have not willfully been disobedient to God? Well, thank goodness you're honest. How does it feel? What goes through your mind, your thinking, when you willfully are disobedient? Tell me, what goes on? I'm sorry? Guilt. Guilt. Terrible guilt. Some of you are pretending that it never happened to you, right? What else do you feel? Shame. You feel shame. You feel guilt. You feel remorse. You know, how could I violate so wonderful love? How could I violate the one who loves me so? And you're good for nothing, aren't you? Until you make it right. You know, isn't that, that's the beautiful thing about communion. We have communion here the first Wednesday of every month. And that's where you just, you just come clean. Be honest to God. Honest to God. And if it's truly a sincerity of heart and honesty that you're laying it all down, asking for forgiveness, you walk out forgiven and cleansed. It's lifted. And how do you feel then? The grass is greener. The sky is bluer. You've never heard the birds sing so wonderfully. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Godliness. It's a, listen, it's allowing Jesus to live his life through you. And there's no greater joy. And all, all of the things of this world evaporate into meaninglessness, right? The cares of this world. Because you're, you're living for the pleasure of one. You're living for the pleasure of God and you're used as his vessel to do what? Love. Joy. Listen, I, how many of you have the Holy Spirit within you? Let me see. Jim, you're not sure? I see you. Oh, good, good, good. Okay. All right. You know what that tells me and you? You have the capacity right now, right now, to, ex to express a love and a joy, a peace and a forgiveness that is beyond understanding. Can't, can't be explained, but it can be experienced, right? A love inexplicable is what the Bible talks about. You have that capacity now. What hinders you from loving that way? Self, your, your bias, your flesh, your flesh. Hey, are, are we, why are we having this uh, service on September the 7th, Tuesday night? Feast of Trumpets, Yom Tara. That's right. That... <laughs> it's, it's Pam's birthday. In honor of her birthday, we'll have her make a coconut cake. <laughs> no, no. We're having, a, we're having a service on September the 7th because potentially that, that could be the day. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I do believe with all my heart there's an association between the Feast of Trumpets and the Rapture of the Church. And the Feast of Trumpets begins on the 7th. So wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if we're all here eating coconut cake and we go together? <laughs> we may be able to tempt the Lord with that coconut cake. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, she can't. No, we won't let her do that. You understand what I'm saying to you? It's not what you do for Christ. You, 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 know, you can't live one way and say, okay, I'm going to do, 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 and I'll compensate for it. No. It's who you are in Christ, before Christ. And that godliness, that, that Christ-likeness, that allow, and allow, you can't do it yourself, so please, don't try. I'm not talking about works. Please, don't misunderstand me. The flesh could never, ever do anything that pleases God. 
but allowing the Holy Spirit to live the love, to bring peace and joy through you to others. We should be so life-giving in the relationships that we have. If my relationship with my wife isn't life-giving, she needs to go to the board and I need to resign. You understand? Or I'm a hypocrite. I'm not representing Jesus. If my relationship to my friends, to my brothers, isn't life-giving, then I need to resign. Because I'm not being the Christian that God's called me to be. Godliness with contentment is the abundant, victorious life. Do you believe that? Yes. It's exactly what it is. Now, now, when you are tempted, you have the power within you now to say no. 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 Now, do whatever it is you got to do to say no. And then get away from the temptation. And experience the joy of living a life that pleases him instead of ourselves. And then, and then you will be a conduit through which he works to bring such joy, peace, love, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such. You can't do it enough. Jesus is never going to say, okay, Mike, you loved enough this week, right? No more love. What do you think this is, a church? <laughs> He's not going to say that. Next week, the third parable. The third parable begins in, chapter, in verse 11 of chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Read Psalm 22 in the process. Psalm 22 is really the expression of the, what Jesus is declaring here in the sacrifice of his life is that he's fulfilling Psalm 22, the Psalm of the Cross. These three parables, very important that you learn who Jesus is in your life as our shepherd. And, and you, listen, you'll never be in fear. You'll never be in want. Satan could never hold anything against you. Do you remember when the apostle Paul was going to meet the Ephesian elders, but he, he didn't want to go to Ephesus? Because if he went to Ephesus, what was going to happen? If he went to the church in Ephesus, what would have happened? Huh? No, he would have never got out of there. They would have had a potluck and they would have had coconut cake and they would have shawarma. I mean, he, they, they loved him. They loved him dearly. And there's no way they would have released him to go on to Jerusalem where he was going to suffer. Suffer. Remember Agabus, the prophet, predicted his suffering? So he meets them on the Isle Miletus. And he says, Satan, you have nothing with which to tempt me. Because they were trying to forbid him from going, remember? And basically what he responds with to the elders there is, that, listen, listen, I must go. Satan has nothing with which to tempt me or to cause me to fear or to be intimidated or to turn back. God is so strong. Jesus is so strong in my life. That's the persecuted church today that John Michael was talking about. Where are you? You need to prepare yourself now, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally, for what potentially could come down the line, so that we can display to the, to the world and, and to our persecutors a love that is unexplainable, that we can love our, yeah. Hey, start by loving your friends. <laughs> yeah. Love your family, okay? And, and then you'll work up to loving your enemies, because you have the capacity to show the world a love that they haven't seen in a long time. The church here in the West is very selfish and self-centered. But if we, yeah, listen, if, we, if Jesus started with just this little body, he turned this country right side up. He turned the world right side up with how many men? Twelve. Yeah, twelve. You're thinking after the flood. <laughs> yeah, shall we stand? Nathan, you got a closing song?